And I'll start with closed manifolds, and then maybe eventually I'll talk about left shift's duality for the manifolds with boundary. Remember what the statement is. So MN is an N manifold, then there exists a unique fundamental class. What? Oriented? Yeah. That's it. Oriented. It's a unique fundamental class, which I'll write right, this way. It's in the entomology, the locally finite or more homology of the manifold. And it has the property that if you take the image in and in the local homology at any point, because the manifold is oriented, this is identified with Z and the fundamental class maps to the generator which I was with the local orientation. So that's the way I formulated it. It works for open manifolds as well as well, microwave duality works for open-oriented open manifolds as well as um, compact ones. And it says if you take cap product with this locally finite homology class, that reduces the map from the compactly supported homology of the manifold into the ordinary homology of the manifold in the opposite dimension. Sorry, in my stop. Okay. And quite duality is a statement that this is a nice one. And again, this holds for open manifolds as well as We're going to be working exclusively for a while with closed manifolds. So now I'm going to assume that the end is closed. Up here, the manifold didn't have a boundary. But when you talk about compact manifolds, they come in two varieties. They're closed manifolds and they're compact manifolds with boundaries, which aren't, strictly speaking, manifolds in this. Okay. So now, the compactly supported cohomology is just the ordinary cohomology. Everything has compact support since the whole space is compact. And the locally finite homology, or L more homology, again, is the ordinary homology. Because these are linear combinations of simplices that have only finitely many that need any compact set, and the manifold is compact. So in this case, the fundamental class lies in the nth homology of the manifold. And tapping with it is an isomorphism from the ordinary cohomology of the manifold into the dual dimensional homology of the manifold. Now we need to to get maximum mileage out of this isomorphism, we need to use also the universal coefficient theorem. And so there's a little exercise for you. Actually, I'll probably do it in the notes. The homology and cohomology of a compact manifold. Theorem in general says 
the k cohomology of the manifold maps onto the homomorphisms from the k cohomology of the manifold to z. And the kernel of this map is x1 of the homology from the to now to z. So that's a statement that's true in general for any space x. Um, but when the groups, so since the groups are finally generated, this x1 term is simply the Pontryagin dual of the torsion finally generated group here and you take x, the free part, free of the union part of course doesn't give you any extensions, and you're left only with the torsion part, and it turns out the extension of the torsion by z here given by the dual group to the torsion. And of course this thing, when m is finally generated, this is a lattice. Free of union group finally drawn. So we see the cohomology is the dual lattice to the k, the k cohomology maps onto the dual lattice to the k cohomology. And the kernel of that is this torsion group. So in fact, this is the torsion of uh, k and m. And this is its field of quotient. Now I want to split my gray duality into two pieces, the free part and the torsion part, where I get different pairings. So we have the free part of the K homology, so the homology mod is torsion. Let me just write tor, meaning the torsion of the group that comes up here, so I don't have to write it again. This is identified with palm of HK of M minus its torsion into Z. So these are lattices, and they're dual lattices. So if we pick an L, a lattice, and HK of M minus in the dual lattice, Now, Quackery duality says you take the free part, that is the cohomology mod torsion, it will, under cap product, go to this homology mod torsion. So, on the other hand, by Quackery duality, working mod torsion, we get Hn minus K mod torsion. And this is Quackery duality. Isomorphism divided out by this, just divided out by the torsion. So you see we've got now a map from H n minus k of n mod torsion into the homomorphisms of H k of n mod torsion. And you see. Well, a map like this, you can take its adjoint, you get a pairing, a map from Hn minus K of M minus torsion, tensor Hk of M minus torsion to Z. So this thing and this thing are completely equivalent. 
If you want to know where to send the tensor product of two elements here, you take the first element, it gives you a homomorphism, and you evaluate that homomorphism on the second element. Conversely, if you're given a map like this, its adjoint is a map from this group to the homomorphisms from this group to Z. And those are equivalent pieces of information. But of course, we have one extra uh, piece of data over here. This map is an isomorphism. And that's captured over here by saying that this is a perfect pair. So the definition of a perfect pairing is that when you take its adjoint, you get an isomorphism. Or in terms of matrices, if you choose a basis for this guy and a basis for this guy, this pairing will be given by a square matrix. And this is an isomorphism, if and only if that matrix is invertible in GL and Z, that is, its determinants plus or minus one. So this is a perfect pairing. We call that the intersection pairing. And I'll try to explain why. Uh, this is the intersection pairing. Well, let me give it's easiest to see, you know, there's another pairing. What's the problem? So suppose I take an element in the n minus k small of the manifold and an element in the k cohomology of the manifold. I can now apply Quaker duality and send this over to beta cap the fundamental class. That's an element in H n minus K of N. And then I could evaluate this cohomology class on this homology class. So I could evaluate alpha on the cap product. So maybe I should have started with K and N minus K, but anyway. But we know the cap product is related to cup product by this formula. So we can view Quackery duality as giving us a pairing H N minus K of M tensor H K of M E to the N group, and it's just alpha tensor beta goes to the cup product of alpha with beta on the fundamental class. And that's a, just a reworking through this evaluation pattern of micro value. What happens to all the torus? Yeah, well, the torus go to zero. I mean, I haven't chosen to divide out by them, but I could because they're both tor here and tor here killed under this pattern. So the pattern induces one. Okay. So that says that these pairings. There's three ways to think about these pairings. This is the way I've written it here, Poincaré duality. It's just an isomorphism from cohomology mod torsion to homology mod torsion in the complementary dimension. Another way to think about it is cup product of cohomology classes to the top evaluated on the fundamental class. Now, I'll show you the third way which is uh, related to this picture of a pairing on homology. So we have Quackery duality, which we can interpret as a pairing on cohomology, or using Quackery duality, we can, we can interpret it as a pairing on homology. And these are all just different ways of saying the same thing. The cohomology pairing is cup to the top, evaluated in the fundamental class. Quackery duality is the cat with the fundamental class. And now what's the homology pairing, and why is it called the intersection pairing? Well, I um, talked about this last time, but let me remind you again. Suppose I have two homology classes in complementary dimension A 
AK and HK, and B in lens K and in lens K from all of G. What happens to the, how do you evaluate the intersection pairing? A, K, dot, B, N minus K, in the What is the intersection pair? Well, what I could do, one thing I could do, is pass both of these through Poincaré duality and get cohomology classes in dimension N minus K and K, cut them together, and evaluate on the fundamental cycle. Or I could pass one of them over to cohomology and evaluate it on the other. Okay, but what's What's the description directly in terms of two homology classes? Well, you're in this oriented manifold, yeah, and you have two cycles, A and B. Cycles of complementary dimension. So these are linear combinations of, of singular simplices. Let's work in a smooth manifold. So I can choose those singular simplices to all be smooth and in generic position with respect to each other or general position. That means the only points of intersection will be in the interior of a K simplex of X where it meets the interior of an N minus K simplex of B. And when they meet, they meet, as in this picture, transversely. So these simplices are smooth. You have a differentials at these interior points, and so you get two tangent spaces, tangent to A at this point, and tangent to B at this point. Now I have tangent spaces because I've got a smooth map of the simplex in, and these points are in the interior of the simplex, so I can take the difference from that. And now I'm going to associate a sign to this intersection point by comparing orientations. So I have the A orientation plus the B orientation. Because of transversality, these spaces are complementary. So I can take the A orientation plus the B orientation. That gives me one orientation of the tangent space. Or I can take the orientation given by the orientation of the manifold, and I compare those. If they're the same, I put plus one. If they're opposite, I put minus one. And I add up all of the points. So we put A and B, we make them smooth, so make A and B smooth. And in general position, I'm just supposed to say you pick representative cycles at yeah. some point. Okay. Yeah. representatives, put them in general position, and count the points. Now let's uh, address Tony's question. Why is this well-defined, why does this give a well-defined pairing homology? In other words, why is it independent of the choice of cycles? Well, let's so suppose we have alpha and alpha prime represent A, and we'll fix beta representing B. So we'll try moving A but fixing B and see if we can prove we get the same answer. Uh, and then we could worry about moving B and fixing A and fixing alpha. Well, since alpha and alpha prime represent A, there's a gamma of dimension, I guess, uh, K plus 1, boundary ga gamma is alpha prime minus alpha. And I'll do the same thing I was talking about over there. I'll make gamma. I'm supposing that alpha and alpha prime are, have smooth representatives in general position with respect to beta. Okay. Well, now I'll do a relative version of, uh, of those, those arguments to without moving alpha to alpha prime, make gamma smooth and in general position with respect to gamma. Okay, so gamma and beta are smooth and in general position. Okay. 
Now things are a little more complicated because the intersection of gamma with beta has dimension one. So uh, the k plus one simplex here will meet an n minus k simplex here in a one manifold and its interior will go up and hit the boundary in some finite number of points. So I have to think about what happens as, as I cross the co-dimension one faces in beta and the co-dimension one faces in gamma. So if you look at a co-dimension one face in beta, because beta is a cycle, the co-dimension one faces appear an even number of times with canceling signs. So when you come in from one side, you have this intersection with gamma coming to this boundary. There'll be another simplex over here with the opposite sign, and that intersection will continue. So you get a smooth arc across these points. Now there may be four sheets coming together here, and the smooth arcs might cross, but that's not really relevant. So that's what happens at the co-dimension one faces of beta. These arcs pair up and their boundaries cancel out in pairs. The same analysis works for the interior co-dimension one faces of gamma. Again, the interior co-dimension one faces appear an even number of times with opposite sign. So the exact same analysis shows that these arcs continue through and there's no boundary created at those intersections. But gamma has other co-dimension one faces, namely the, the boundary of gamma, those that make up alpha and alpha prime. And there's nothing, there's no cancellation there. So in fact, what you see is that the boundary of gamma dot beta is alpha prime dot beta minus alpha dot beta. So this is a one manifold, and its boundary is the difference of the two things we're trying to compute. But the boundary of a one manifold, algebraically, is zero. Because the one manifold is made up of circles with no boundary components, and intervals, the two boundary components of the opposite side. So that's why this intersection is well defined, uh, independently represented, at least for alpha and a to a symmetric argument. So that's the intersection pattern, and that's the other description of point duality. Or at least the free part of point duality. All right. So now I'm going to get some consequences for the homology of the manifold. Um, will you even take representative in alpha, in the class alpha and beta, so that their intersections are the minimal kind? So every intersection point? Yeah, at this level, yes. At this level. Uh, because I'm working with cycles. If you ask the same question for manifolds, that turns out to be one of the fundamental questions in topology. And if k and n minus k are at least three, then you can. Manifolds. Yeah, if you have two manifolds, if you're in an n manifold and you let a and b be sub, a and b are sub-manifolds of dimension k and n minus k, and you ask the question, can you arrange that all the intersection points have the same sign? In other words, can you cancel a plus with a minus? That's really what you've got to do. The answer is if both k and n minus k are at least three, then you can, but not otherwise. Otherwise, we don't know, or we can't. No, can. there are many counterexamples. So we need the manifold to be connected to cancel the. Yeah, two. that's right. I mean, if the manifold is not simply connected, you can't count the algebraic intersection in. Z, you have to count it in Z of the fundamental group, but then you get the same result. Right. And this is, I don't know if you've ever heard about how topology breaks down, but in topology, there are theorems for manifolds of dimension greater than equal to five. There are sort of homogeneous theorems. They apply to all manifolds of dimension greater than equal to five. But they don't apply to four manifolds and three manifolds. Or surfaces, but surfaces are sort of easy to understand. And the reason they don't is exactly that problem. You can't cancel 
these extra points of intersection. You can't make the geometric intersection the same size as the algebraic intersection. This turns out to be an essential problem. High dimensions, get around it because you have enough room, and low dimensions you can't, and things are different in low dimensions. Why five is fine since we have three? Yeah, well, it's, oh. let's not go into that. I mean, in some sense, the theorem the theorems are about boredisms between manifolds, so you're really talking about something in dimension six. Yeah. So let's think about, okay, so we have this pairing, HK mod torsion of M, this perfect pairing, HN minus K mod torsion, DZ, perfect pairing. It has a sign symmetry. If this is A, then to B goes to A dot B, then reversing the roles, B tensor A goes to B dot A, which is minus 1 to the K, n minus K. So there's a sign here. Sort of obvious from the geometric description, if you change the order of a k plane and an n minus k plane, you flip the orientation they determine by minus 1 to the k times n minus k. If you look at the cohomology cup product, you can replace alpha cup beta on m by beta cup alpha on m. These will differ again by the same sign. Either approach shows you that this is the sum. Now that's not so interesting when k and n minus k are different, but it does have real significance when k is equal to n minus k. Well, it does say that the kth betting number is equal to n, n minus k betting number, betting number being the rank of the model. So Poincaré duality tells you that. But now let's suppose that n is even, n equals k. Then we have a pairing hk of m by torsion tensor hk of m by torsion and z. So this is the, when the dimension of the manifold is even, you have exactly one homology group it's paired with itself under the intersection pairing. It's the middle homology group. And this pairing is perfect. And it's the minus 1 to the k symmetric. So if k is odd, it's skew symmetric. If k is even, it's symmetric. So if I choose a basis for this lattice, I get a square matrix, and it's either symmetric when k is even, or skew symmetric as a matrix when k is odd. And it has determinant plus or minus 1. Okay. Well, let's think about what those pairings look like. Uh, in terms of matrices, what are we doing? We choose a basis, we get a, either symmetric or skew symmetric matrix. And the change we're allowed to make is to change the basis. And that has the effect on the, pair, on the matrix for the pairing of sending the original matrix to B transpose A B along the vertical matrix B. So we're studying these matrices not up to conjugation, but up to this uh, B transpose B operation. Uh, we're studying square, matrix, square, either symmetric or skew symmetric matrices of arbitrary rank up to this equivalence relation. Well, when k is odd, there's not much to say. So this is the skew case, skew symmetric case. So skew symmetric matrix. And the little theorem or lemma of the proposition is that uh, the rank of HK 
is even. And the pairing is equivalent to, that is, is the basis in which the pairing looks like an orthogonal sum of two by two blocks, like that. So the only invariant of such self-pairings of a, a skew-symmetric self-pairings of a lattice, perfect pairings, the only invariant is the rank of the group on which the pairing operates. And the condition is that rank has to be even, and then the pairing is completely determined at the isomorphism. Well, let me prove that for you. It's pretty easy. The magic here is that x dot x equals zero for all x in the lattice. So I'm thinking now, let me just simplify my notation. A skew-symmetric pairing on the lattice. The lattice would be the homology modulatory. All right, so you take an indivisible element in this lattice. So it's, a, it's part of a basis. Every indivisible element extends to a basis. And therefore, there's a homomorphism from L to Z that sends X to 1. The pairing is perfect, meaning that every homomorphism from the lattice to Z is gotten by taking dot product with some element in the lattice. So that means there exists a Y in the lattice with X dot Y equal 1. So now we've already got this much of our little two by two block. We have x dot x is zero, y dot y is zero, and x dot y is one. Well, we have this one too. Skew symmetric, so y dot x is minus one. So x and y produce a little two by two block here. The point is that this is a unimodular pairing, and therefore it generates an orthogonal direct sum. So we can split the pairing as this little two by two piece plus something that's perpendicular to everything in the two by two piece and of course lower rank. And then we just go by induction. So let me show you why that is. So, so we have, so x, y, and let's extend to a basis. We want to do z, k. And then we'll replace z, i by z, i. Minus maybe x dot z i y plus y dot z i x. So they will span the same thing that I'm just adding multiples of x and y to the z i. So if this is a basis, I'll still have a basis. And now z i prime x dot z i prime is x dot z i minus x dot z i x dot y, and then x dot x is 0, so these can't, this is 1, so these cancel, and y dot z i prime is y dot z i, y dot y is 0, so that goes away, and then I have plus y dot z i, y dot x, well so this is minus 1, and these cancel. So these new elements, or, or orthogonal under the pair. So I'm going to just go by induction and you write this in as a direct sum of these two pieces. So, one corollary. <laughs> M4K plus 2 closed. Betty numbers away from the middle pair up. Betty k is Betty n minus k. So those come in pairs. So the signs don't matter. Well, they have the same sign actually. So they add, they add up to, they give you an even number. And we've just seen the middle homology has even rank. So the whole homology has even rank. And therefore the ultimate sum. 
no other questions. This is not true for non-orientable manifolds. duality mod 2 for all manifolds. I haven't talked about that, but all manifolds are orientable over Z2. And indeed, the cohomology of RP2 satisfies Poincaré duality with Z2 coefficients. Oh, quotient? Well, no, it's now, a, we're not talking about vector space, there's no torsion. We're working characteristic 2. These are vector spaces with two elements, yeah. Oh, and skew symmetry works differently in characteristic two. That's right. Skew symmetry. This is no longer true in characteristic two. So the pairing is skew symmetric still. Of course, that doesn't mean anything in characteristic two. And indeed, what is the first cohomology of RP2 with Z2 coefficients? Z2. What's the fundamental component? Two. So what's the first cohomology of Z2 coefficient? It's C mod 2. And x dot x is 1 mod 2. So you lose the skew symmetry, and thus you lose the even rank condition. Right? You take two circles in RP2, two lines in, in RP2, two RP1s in RP2, they meet a single point. So the intersection pattern is not true. You get you don't get this. The skew symmetry doesn't tell you the things that age. Now let's go to a much more interesting case. 4K manifolds. So now we're looking at symmetric unimodular pairings. Well, first thing to remark is that this result doesn't hold. Now it's symmetry rather than skew symmetry, so I don't get this even rank in the middle necessarily. So what's an example of a manifold of dimension 4K whose oil characteristic is I? CP2. CP2. And its middle homology group has rank 1, and the pairing is x dot x is 1. But in fact, if we think about, forget manifolds for a moment, we just think about these pairings, the most, the simplest pairing you can write down are the two of them, actually, are these two. This is the one by one pairing where x dot x, x is a generator, is one. And this is the one by one pairing where x dot x is minus one. Those are both legitimate pairings. CP2 realizes this pairing. Can you think of a manifold that realizes this pairing? Huh? to bar the inverse orientation. Change the reverse the orientation, you change the sign of the pairing. Okay. Now, one thing you can always do is anytime you have some pairings, you can take an orthogonal sum. Taking orthogonal sums of these just produces a matrix with plus and minus ones down the diagonal. So those are interesting pairings, zero to or else. Uh, for example, all plus ones would be gotten by taking a connected sum of a bunch of CP2s. If you want plus ones and minus ones, take connected sums of CP2s and the opposite of CP2s. So that would realize all these points. Connected sum. Sorry? Connected sum? Connected sum. You take, you have two manifolds of dimension n, you take a ball out of each one of them, you get now manifolds with boundary, the boundary being an n minus one sphere, and you two them. Together or Why don't you take the union? You could. Oh. I sort of think of connected manifolds. You have to reverse the orientation of one of the boundaries, right? If you want an orientable manifold. Okay. 
Well, there are some other pairings that we haven't listed yet. Not all the pairings look like this. There's this pairing that are analogous to what we have in the skew symmetry plurals. So that's a clearly unimodular, the determinant of that matrix is minus one pairing. Anybody know a four manifold that has that as pairing? S2 cross S2. S2 cross S2. The two factors meet, don't meet themselves because you can push them off and they meet each other once. S2 cross S2 is an example. Is this pairing isomorphic to one of these? Why not? It's two. Even. Okay. This pairing is what's known as even. That is x dot x is congruent to zero mod two for all x in the lattice. And of course, that's not true for these pairings. Well, how do you know this? Certainly, the two basis elements have this property. But in fact, there's a little claim a pairing is even. Symmetric pairing. If and only if sum and therefore all matrix representatives have even entries. know whether or not a pairing is even if it's presented to you as a symmetric matrix. You just look at the diagonal entries. If they're all even, the, the pairing is even. If one of them is odd, of course it's not. Sorry? Okay. What is that? Matrix rep representative. Right? L. Yes. L. X in L. That is. X in L? Yes. What is that? L is the lattice of, on which the pairing exists. So I'm just working with a, a lattice. If I have a generator free of the any group, and I have some pairing on that lattice, a pairing on L. OK, so here's a new one. Let me give you another new one. E8. So it's an 8 by 8 matrix. It has, I'm going to put plus 2's this time, plus 2's down the diagonal. Plus 2's down the diagonal. And it goes with the Dinkin diagram of the Cartan matrix for the Lee algebra or Lee group E8. You think of the dots, or vertices of the Dinkin diagram, as being the generators of this lattice. So these diagonal entries say what the intersection of the basis element associated with each dot with itself is. It's two. Okay. The off-diagonal entries are either zero or one. So an off-diagonal entry has an I and a J. It's associated, an off-diagonal entry is associated with two vertices in this diagram. This entry will be zero unless these two are connected by a bond in this graph. So you have, you have a bunch of ones here. Let's support it at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I have 1 meets 2, 2 meets 3, 3 meets 4, 4 meets 5, 5 meets 6, 6 meets 7, but 7 doesn't meet 8. Now, of course, it's symmetric, so you have the ones down here as well. 
So that's all of those bonds, and that 8 needs 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Is this uh, like it's 1 or 1? Huh? It's 1, not, 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 ne not, ne not negative 1. No, it's plus 1. I mean, you can, you know, you can go through here and change the sign of every other generator and turn these plus ones into minus one. Oh, oh yes. Right. So you have freedom about it. So you could make them all minus ones because you just flip every even one and keep every odd one the same, and then. Usually, for reasons I don't want to go into, one puts minus twos down the diagonal, but I want to put plus twos. Because of that remark about switching the signs of the ones, changing the sign of the diagonal is equivalent to changing the sign of the whole matrix. Okay, so it's a nice exercise. Prove that this is a unimodular matrix. It's determined it's, I don't remember if it's plus one or minus one, but anyway, it's a unit. And that's related to the fact that, and, and about this Lie group or Lie algebra, about the Lie group. If you take this Lie algebra and you turn it into a Lie group, a compact Lie group, then you can have several different, in general, several different Lie groups that have the same Lie algebra. Like SU2, the three sphere, and SO3 have the same Lie algebra. That's because in the simply connected form of the group, SU2 or the three sphere, there's a non-trivial center. And then you're free to divide out by any subgroup of the center. You get a new form of the group. The fact that this matrix has determinant 1 so that the simply connected version of this group has trivial center. The order of the center is the determinant, the absolute value of the determinant of this matrix. So this group has only a simply connected representative. And it's the only ADE group with that property. Anyway. So that's an interesting one. Okay, it turns out. So what do they call that group? Is that EA also? Yeah, they call it EA. And it's a Cartan matrix for EA. Is what it is. But you can also you can you, you can always take a single connected group. Yes. You can always take the the two extremes are the simply connected form of the group and the adjoint form of the group. So for SU two, that's the simply connected form of the group. The adjoint is SU. If the group acts on its Lie algebra. Yes. If you have the adjoint representation, you can take, that's an action of the group, but it can have a kernel. So let's divide by the kernel to get an effective action. And for these simple Lie groups, that's for dividing down by the center. I mean, the center acts trivially. Right? So the adjoint form of the group is the simply connected form of the group by the center. Anyway, if we work Working over it's a new phone. my daughter. <laughs> I'll talk to her later. So working over a field doesn't really matter. If you are a car, you can always Diagonalize these matrices. And that really goes back to a variant of this comment I made over here. Once you get, I said, once you got a matrix of determinant plus or minus one, you could split off the P's as an orthogonal complement. Well, the real statement is once you get a piece whose determinant is a unit in your ground ring, then you can split that one off. Now our ground ring is a field, so everything except zero is a unit. So if you have any element x, you find an x in the, the lattice tensor q. So 
let's say x dot x is not equal to zero, a unit in Q, then you can split whatever x is, x dot x equals a, not equal to zero. You can split a, zeros here, and then something smaller. And you just keep going. You just have to need to have find a non-zero element to be able to start diagonalizing the matrix. Well, there are lots of non-zero elements here. So over Q or R, or any field in between, you can diagonalize the matrix. It's sort of nicer, and once you've diagonalized it, you can of course change these elements by any square in the field. Because if you multiply the generator by lambda, you multiply its inner product with itself by the lambda squared. So these are well-defined mod squares. Now Q, Q mod Q squared is a mess. But R mod R squared is very nice. It's plus minus one. Every positive number is a square, no negative number is a square. So if we work over R, This matrix, any, any unimodular matrix, A, symmetric unimodular, is equivalent to what I had just a few minutes ago on the board. This is over R, not over Z. And that gives you an invariant of these pairings called the, in, uh, I never know which is the signature and which is the index. Let's call it the signature. The signature is the number of plus ones minus the number of minus ones when you diagonalize over the reals. So a matrix would be positive definite if you get plus ones down the diagonal. It would be, so that's like the usual inner product of our end. It would be negative definite if you get all minus ones down the diagonal. And if you get a mix, you'll have a positive definite piece and a negative definite piece. And every symmetric form doesn't have to be unimodular, it just has to have non-zero determinant, diagonalizes over the reals. Diagonalizes over any field, but diagonalizes to plus minus ones over the reals. We lose too many things. What? But but then we lose some money. That's right. That's right. We lose a lot. The signature is a very coarse invariant. How about Q? How about two? And Q. You, if we just Q. Q. Uh, Q. Then you, then you, that's right. Then you have a lot more information than Q. Is it so coarser than over Z? Uh, well, it depends what kind of question. A question you often ask is, does a form represents zero, for example. Does it represent zero? Is there some x so that x dot x is zero? In over Q. Well, representing zero over zero over Q is the same. Because if you have a rational solution that represents zero multiplied to clear denominators, and you'll have an integral solution that represents zero. No, I. My question is, if you start from the Z lattice. Yeah. The Q is not the full invariant of the Z oh. lattice. No. But there's a lot more information in the Q lattice than there is in the Z lattice. Is there any good reference for this? Uh, Over Q. Well, there's beautiful treatises by both Sayre and Milner on this stuff. Symmetric quadratic. Forms of symmetric bilinear pairs. Signature is perfectly defined in dimension 4k plus 2 is just always zero? Yes. Well, no, because you can't diagonalize. 4k plus 2. Oh, yeah, right. That's right. You can't, yes, you can diagonalize and you're yeah. plus and minus one. No. No, that's not right. You can't diagonalize over q or r. Because x dot x is always zero. Yes. But in some sense, you're right. If it had a signature, it would be zero. 
So here's a theorem. This is a great theorem. So maybe I'll make a definition and I'll tell you a theorem, which works in the opposite way from what I was just saying to you about recovering the form of Q. So form is indefinite. If it's neither positive nor negative definite, if the signature in absolute value is strictly less than the right. So when you diagonalize it over R, you get both plus ones and minus ones. So the positive definite forms where they're all pluses, the negative definite forms where they're all minuses, and then the, everything else is indefinite. Okay. And we talk about the parity of a form. Well, the two possibilities are even and odd. Okay. And here's an incredible thing. Beautiful thing. Wait, what is it? Even and odd mean? If x dot x is even for every element, okay. it's said to be even. Otherwise, it's said to be odd. If you have one element whose square is odd, it's an odd form. Theorem. Restrictions on these three invariants is, of course, the absolute value of the signature has to be less than the rank because it's indefinite form. Uh, the signature has to be congruent to the rank minus two because the rank is the total number of plus and minuses, and the signature is the difference of them. And lastly, and very interestingly, if even, if the parity is even. Then the signature is kind of easy on that page. It's an amazing thing. It's not true, there's no extension for definite forms. And I'll show you that in a minute. Not true for definite forms. So let me give you an example of that. Well, I guess I have to tell you, E8 is positive definite, as I've written it. So this is a positive definite form. So it determines it to be 1. I don't know if it's plus or well, I guess. Yeah. Okay, well that doesn't, this is the only even positive definite form of rank 8. So, in some sense, it still satisfies this theorem. It's the only rank 8, signature 8, even form. Okay. If 
if we change a two to, to negative two, is it still positive? Yeah. It's negative, definitely. Because that flips the sign of everything. I mean, no, if I'm only the two, one is still one. Yeah, but as, as I was explaining to him, if you change the sign of your, every other generator, change the sign of two, four, six, and eight, that will change the sign of every bond from plus one to minus one. So you can flip those without doing anything that I want to So if you change the sign here, in effect, you change the sign everywhere. So that will be a negative definite form. Negative definite, even, right, eight. Minus eight. Okay, but let me give you an example of two forms that have all these invariants the same and they're not equal. So these are definite forms of rank 9. So the signature is 9, rank is 9, and the parity is odd for both of them. So all three invariants agree. These forms are not isomorphic. So how do I know that? Well, let's look for solutions x dot x equals 1. So let's find solutions. Over here, let's let the generators be E1 to E9. EI squared is 1. EI dot EJ is 0. So summation AI EI squared is simply summation A I squared. If that's one, then all the A I except one of them have to be zero, and the last one has to be plus or minus one. So there are 18 solutions here to that equation. Now let's go over here and let's let this be E9 and we have some basis X1 to X8. Well, let's call an element in here X. And let's look at, uh, that's bad, Y. Let's look at Y plus A E9 and let's square that. Well, these are perpendicular, so I simply get Y squared plus A squared y squared is even, and y squared is greater than or equal to zero, because it's a positive definite form. And if y squared equals zero, then y equals zero, because it's a positive definite form. So the only solution to this equation is a equals plus minus one, and y equals zero. So two solutions here. Plus and minus nine are the only solutions. Well, these forms can't be isomorphic over the integers because this is a problem. I mean, this, if you had an isomorphism over the integers, the solutions of this equation here, we go to solutions there. So it's an invariant. In fact, you can make all sorts of invariants. You count the number of solutions to x squared equals you know, some number in the power series. Arithmetic. Okay. Now I want to tell you about four manifolds and what our esteemed colleague found in the bottom did. When he was a graduate student. So, four manifolds. Simply connected. So, in homotopy theory, homotopy type, we can start with a wedge of two spheres mapping on to, so the second homology of a, of a four manifold 
is a free of Yidgen group by point grade duality. Because remember the torsion in H upper 2 is the dual to the torsion in H lower 1. Star means on the Z here. But this is a simply connected manifold, so there is no torsion in H1. So H2 has no torsion, but so this is zero. But Frankly duality says the second homology and that's going to be cohomology are isomorphic. So there's no torsion in the second homology either. So this is a free abelian group, H2. So simply choose a basis by the Horaywitz theorem where those elements are all spherical. So you just map two spheres in hitting a basis of H2. This manifold has no H3. So if you look at the relative homology of M mod these two spheres in there, M4, the first non-trivial homology group is this is isomorphic in fact A4 of M, just from the long exact sequence. This maps isomorphically onto H0 and H2, and there's the H4 of that building. So that means pi 4 of M4 mod this way of two spheres is also a Z. Which problem? What is this notation? Huh? What is pi 4 of M, M? What is uh, H4 this of is, This is a space and a subspace. Oh. oh. So this oh, is a relative oh, homology, oh, homology of the pair. Oh. And this is homotopy of the pair. So maps of the four disk into here with boundary here. And the mapping is from the, the is by H2, me. Yes, oh. by the two skeleton, if you will. And the two spheres mapped into hit generators, a basis for the second homology. So this induced map on second homology is an isomorphism. On H0, it's an isomorphism. All right, so what that means is that we have this wedge of spheres, and there's a three-sphere mapping in M4. There's a three-sphere mapping here, and a V4 mapping there. A diagram like this, and this represents the relative homotopy and therefore the relative homology. So if I form the adjunction space, union over this map F, E4, that maps into the manifold, and it's an isomorphism on homology, and therefore a homotopy equivalent. So a four-manifold in homotopy theory is obtained by taking a wedge of two spheres and attaching one four cell. Some four-manifolds have Morse functions that look like that. One minimum, a bunch of critical points of index two, and then one maximum, local maximum. And that would give this kind of picture. And right now, if you think about pi 3 of a wedge of two spheres, it's a symmetric matrix. And that symmetric matrix is exactly the cup product matrix from H2 of M and H4 of M. So you have to choose an orientation. So what I'm telling you is that the homotopy type of a simply connected four manifold is completely determined by the intersection pairing, or if you want, the coprotic pairing on H2. Homotopy type. Homotopy type. Because I've given you an explicit representative, wedge of two spheres mapping to the second homology, and then the attaching map to put on the four cell is given by the intersection. So every intersection form occurs as a homotopy a, a, a space that's homotopy, is the homotopy, how do I want to say it? A homotopy type that satisfies Poincaré duality in dimension four. Every pairing is realized. So now you can ask which ones are realized by manifolds. 
So in homotopy theory, all these pairings are realized by spaces satisfied by Fourier duality. Which ones are realized by manifolds? Write down what I just said there. So, given a symmetric unimodular parent that exists a space X simply connected, satisfying primary reality in dimension four. And by that, I simply mean the fourth homology of X has a class, which we'll call the fundamental class, so that capping with it induces an isomorphism from cohomology to homology. With this pairing on H2. Smooth 
then the signature of n is kind of to 0 minus 16. It's a Dirac operator, and um, it, using that, you can see the signature is divisible by 16. Is this any format form or just spin? Any even smooth format form. Okay, even in exception form. But that's only for even. Yeah. Oh, but E. Uh, oh, so it doesn't say, I mean, this one could have been realized. So E8. Yeah. So we knew already that some forms couldn't be realized by smooth manifolds, namely even forms of signature A, like E8. The first even form that's known to be realized by a smooth manifold is the famous K3 surface. Which is a, I don't want to think about it, it's a cordic hypersurface CP3 given by a, a generic polynomial of degree 4 in CP3. It's simply connected because hypersurfaces in CP3 are always simply connected. And its second homology has rank 22, and it's this. Three copies of the hyperbolic plus EA plus PA. So it's an indefinite form, indefinite even form. It's still not known. whether two copies of the hyperbolic plus CA plus CA is realized by a smooth manifold. The Donaldson's theorem about non-existence is really about definite. Does the same thing about indefinite forms. I mean, he went on to prove other beautiful theorems about four manifolds, but they weren't really of this nature. So they're still open. Still open. You can't get E8 plus E8. That's what Donaldson proved, because that's a definite form. It's not diagonalizable. You can get three copies of a hyperbolic plus E8 plus E8. Can you get two? Can you get one? Two and one are not known. Right. Yeah. So Friedman showed, for example, that E8 is realized as a pairing of a topological four manifold. So this index theory argument with the Dirac operator definitely doesn't hold in the topological category. You might ask me where PL manifolds fit in all of this if you've ever heard about PL manifolds. Well, it turns out every PL form manifold is smoothable, so they fit with the smooth stuff. Our colleague Sullivan likes to, wants to know about by Lipschitz, quasi conformal, where they fit, and that's done on them. He and Donaldson did manage to prove some version of Donaldson's first theorem. So those manifolds are not topological. That, that category is distinct from topological. I have no idea if the full Donaldson theory applies in that category or not. Why? So what do those Friedman manifolds look like? Oh, the constructions of they have no, they have no, they should not exist. <laughs> I mean, they're incredibly wild. So, I mean, I give you only the most. I mean, are they limits? I mean, what's yeah, yeah, there are infinite limits of. Well, it's back to this question about canceling points of intersection. So, you know, the famous Whitney disk question you have two points of intersection. We're now we're talking about two spheres, two two spheres in a four manifold. And they, we would like to make the geometric intersection equally odd, algebraic intersection. So we have a pair of points, a plus and a minus, we want to cancel it. 
So we draw our arcs on each sphere between these two points that we want to cancel. And so here's one sphere, here's the other sphere. We draw these arcs, an arc on one sphere, an arc on the other sphere. That makes a loop. This is simply connected manifold. If that loop bounds an embedded disk, which is otherwise disjoint from these spheres, then you can just push this guy across and remove the points. The problem is you're trying to embed a disk, a two disk in four manifold. Well, when you put it in generically, it's going to meet itself. So this disk won't be embedded. It will do something like it'll have self-intersections. Well, now you could try to solve the problem up here and remove those self-intersections and you create more self-intersections. So Kasson said, just keep doing it and take a limit and a union and you get something that has at least the right homotopy type called the Kasson angle. So you start with a loop that you're trying to make bound an embedded disk and you sort of fatten it up and you get some crazy neighborhood. It's a union of smaller and smaller neighborhoods of these pieces that you just keep doing. It's a tree, you just keep going. That's a chasm handle. Friedman managed to show that there's this incredibly wild two disc in there. Okay. So then he could cancel these points and do surgery. <laughs> have no business existing. I mean, the, the funny thing is that, I mean, these are, it comes from this old Bing topology. You take a manifold and you have some sort of bunch of compact sets and you collapse into points, uh, all decompositions, basically. And sometimes you get a manifold back just by accident. Well, it's, this is one of those times. Something that no reason to think it should be a manifold, and no other dimension is it a manifold, but in dimension four, magically, it becomes. All right. I was going to tell you about linking pairings, but I ran out of time and energy, so I'll stop here. The intersection is going to be more interesting. Um, so I'm going to be gone January, February. I could talk about rational homotopy theory when I get back. Why don't we see how you feel about it and how I feel about it. So I'll email the class list I have for these lectures. And if I get enough positive responses and bodies showing up, I'll talk. And if I don't, I won't. You've kept high enough attendance at this point already, so I can call this your little lectures. What? You've kept high enough attendance to this point for the trip. Well, it sort of dipped down there for a while, but it's, it's bounced back a little bit. One, two, three, four. We lost him in five. Six, five. <laughs> Should I count you? Yes, I'm, I mean, I'm taking notes. Uh, 13, 14, 15, yeah, 15. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I love the rational homotopy theory, so I'd be happy with that. I want to prove this theory. Okay. So, so with Chris, you know, you know, what was in Friedman's mind? Where did he, you know, what tradition was there of uh, doing stuff like this? In the well, it, I mean, the, there was Kasson, right? So uh -huh. I don't know why Kasson started. I mean, Four manifolds were all the rage, you know. All these questions are just no techniques for answers. So Andrew was really thinking about it. And uh, you know, it was one of these sort of things where, you know, Mike worked on it for five or seven years and you know, was almost ready to give up and make a little progress and you know, so it kept hanging in there. Which Edwards was doing some stuff like that. Canon was doing some stuff like that. So there were a few people around. Then topology is sort of gone by the way. Well, it had its supernova. Yeah, right. Right. it's supernova right there. Well, and also the double suspension. Yeah. The nine combinatorial triangulations. So if you take a homology three sphere and you suspend it once, that's not a manifold. Because in a manifold, every point as a neighborhood, a punctured neighborhood is simply connected, namely the ball, or I'm sure it's a small punctured neighborhood. If you suspend a homology sphere with non-trivial fundamental group, then you puncture neighborhoods of the cone points, 
are not simply connected. You know, or very small. So that's not a manifold. Now suspend it again. That's another way to say take the original homology three sphere and join it to a circle. Now the circle still has these non-simply connected neighborhoods and the circle of a five sphere ought to have a simply connected. Uh, I mean, the normal directions ought to be simply, function normal directions ought to be simply connected. But that's only if the sphere is, uh, the circle is locally flat in the five sphere. So there's some homeomorphism of this double suspension to the five sphere that turns that circle into you know some Alexander Horn sphere type thing. It doesn't have these nice simply connected neighborhoods. Edwards proved that. So that's again being tight collapsing space stuff. Right. So that was around. That was about the same time, a little bit earlier. Yeah. All right, well, have a good uh, holiday. Maybe if we will still have this course. Uh,